The first flight of the massive Space Launch System rocket is finally about to happen. Artemis 1 will be the first fully integrated flight of both the SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft. The uncrewed mission will see the spacecraft fly a weeks-long trek around the moon before returning to Earth. If successful, it'll prove the giant rocket and deep space spacecraft is ready to fly people on the very next mission, currently expected to happen in about two years. It's been a long road to get to this point, a story that would take longer than there is time for in this video. Artemis and SLS is designed to send people beyond low Earth orbit for the first time since the end of the Apollo program in 1972. But this time, NASA plans to go to the moon in a more sustainable way using international and commercial partnerships, as the agency continues its long-term gaze toward Mars. The program will also see the first woman and first person of color descend to the moon's surface. The rocket's Block 1 variant, yes, there are upgrades planned for this behemoth, stands 98 meters tall with an Orion spacecraft perched on top. It has two Northrop Grumman-provided five-segment solid rocket boosters that each stand 54 meters tall and are 3.7 meters wide. The core stage of the rocket, built by Boeing, is 65 meters tall and 8.5 meters wide. At its base are four RS-25 engines that consume liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen propellants. Sitting atop the core is a launch vehicle stage adapter that holds an upper stage called the Interim Cryogenic Propulsion Stage, or ICPS. It has a single liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen consuming RL-10 engine and is provided by United Launch Alliance. On top of that is the Orion Stage Adapter, which also includes a number of rideshare CubeSats. The Orion Stack, which itself includes the spacecraft, protective panels for the service module during launch, and the launch abort system, tops off the rocket. Orion itself is two parts, a conical crew module built by Lockheed Martin and a service module built by the European Space Agency. Together they are about 5 meters wide and 8 meters long with a mass of about 26,000 kilograms. The crew module has a habitable volume of about 9 cubic meters for up to 4 astronauts. The European service module has 4 solar panels to provide the spacecraft with its power during its mission. Its main engine, the AJ-10, is a former Space Shuttle Orbital Maneuvering System engine, which itself was a variant of the Apollo Service Module engine. During the first few minutes of ascent, the Orion spacecraft has a launch abort system that can pull the crew module away from the SLS in the event of an emergency. It's no longer needed after about three and a half minutes into a nominal flight and is jettisoned. While Artemis 1 will be the first flight of Orion atop SLS, it's not the first flight of Orion. Its first flight test actually occurred in December 2014 during the four and a half hour long Exploration Flight Test 1 after being launched by a United Launch Alliance Delta IV Heavy rocket. Development of Orion actually began in 2006 under the now cancelled Constellation program. The SLS rocket as we know today has been in development since 2011 and uses legacy spatial hardware. But it wasn't as simple as plugging the old parts together in new ways. This isn't Gerbil Space Program. Rather, each part, the solid rocket boosters, the space shuttle main engines, and even the tools on the ground to make and test all the pieces, all had to be upgraded, tested, and upgraded even more. The solid rocket boosters were upgraded from its four segments to five. Its testing was continued from the previously canceled Constellation and Ares-1 programs, but there were still new propellant mixtures and techniques that needed to be tested and verified. Moreover, the space shuttle main engines, called RS-25s, needed to be upgraded to provide greater power and withstand more intense heat. No longer were there three situated somewhat away from the hot solid rocket boosters as they were on the space shuttle. Now there would be four placed right next to the solid rocket boosters. There is also new control hardware inside the engines. Then there's the core stage of the SLS. It may look like a stretched version of the space shuttle external tank, but the dynamics of launch are totally different. It's also made of different materials and machined with modern techniques. All of these had to be tested and verified. It may look shuttle derived on the outside, but it is truly a new beast. I've done several videos over the various challenges of getting SLS to where it is today. I'll link to a playlist right here, as well as in the description below. Now that all of the testing is behind NASA, it's finally time to launch this rocket on its maiden voyage. It's also time for you to launch this video's like button into orbit. It helps with the YouTube algorithm and lets me know what you are all interested in. So when is SLS going to launch? Artemis 1 will launch at NASA's Launch Complex 39B at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Right now, NASA is targeting a two-hour window opening at 8.33 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 12.33 UTC, August 29th, 2022. 
but be sure to check the description for an updated launch time, because if the history of this vehicle says anything, there will be more delays. Two other dates are penciled in for September 2nd and September 5th. If Artemis 1 doesn't make one of those three dates, it has another two-week window that runs from September 19th to October 4th. Artemis 1 is an uncrewed shakedown test to prove the spacecraft and rocket will be ready for people during the Artemis 2 mission in 2024. The mission will begin with the ignition of the four RS-25 engines. Together with the twin solid rocket boosters, the SLS produces about 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. The boosters burn for about two minutes before falling away, and they will not be recovered. The core stage will fire for a total of eight and a half minutes to place the ICPS and Orion spacecraft into an elliptical orbit about 160 by 1800 kilometers. However, this orbit still dips into the atmosphere once it comes back around. As such, the ICPS Orion stack will separate and coast to the highest point of its orbit before performing a 22 second orbit raising maneuver. The core stage will remain in the initial orbit, which will allow it to harmlessly burn up in the atmosphere at a predetermined location over the ocean. After initial checkouts, the ICPS will propel Orion into a translunar trajectory just over 90 minutes after liftoff. It'll be the first spacecraft built for humans to do so since the Apollo 17 mission in December 1972. The 18 minute burn will increase the spacecraft speed from about 28,000 kilometers per hour to more than 36,000 kilometers per hour. Roughly a half hour later, the Orion spacecraft is expected to separate from the upper stage and coast for several days. Once Orion separates, the ICPS can release the 10 CubeSat tagalongs. These small spacecraft, each not much larger than a shoebox, will be deployed into deep space. Among those with a CubeSat aboard are several universities, Lockheed Martin, the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, several NASA centers, and the European Space Agency. When Orion reaches the moon, its main engine will perform two burns, one as a powered lunar flyby, and another to enter a distant retrograde orbit around the moon, which will take the spacecraft some 60,000 kilometers at its farthest above the lunar surface on the side facing away from Earth. This will make Orion, during Artemis 1, the farthest away any human spacecraft built for humans has ever been. This distant retrograde orbit is a highly stable orbit that is balanced between the gravitational pull of both Earth and the moon. Using this orbit, Orion can circle the moon once every 12 days. It's called a retrograde orbit because the spacecraft will be traveling in the opposite direction that the moon travels around Earth. For a long mission duration, Orion will circle the moon one and a half times. For a short duration mission, the spacecraft will only complete a half an orbit around the moon. Either way, when it's time to come home, Orion will perform another two burns, a departure burn from the distant retrograde orbit and a powered flyby of the moon to place it on a trajectory back to Earth. Orion will then fall toward the planet for the next several days. When the spacecraft is about 5,000 kilometers above Earth, the crew module will separate from the European service module. Reentry will begin when the crew module is about 100 kilometers above the surface. During reentry, the capsule's heat shield is expected to get as hot as about 2,800 degrees Celsius. Artemis 1 will attempt the first skip entry for a human spacecraft, meaning it'll dip into the upper part of the Earth's atmosphere before using the atmosphere and lift produced by the capsule to skip right back out and accurately pinpoint its final location in the Pacific Ocean. NASA says it's kind of like skipping a rock across the water in a pond. Ultimately, after slowing down from about 40,000 kilometers per hour to just 480 kilometers per hour, a series of parachutes will open, culminating in three main chutes. That will slow the spacecraft even more to just over 30 kilometers per hour. The capsule will then softly splash down in the Pacific Ocean, roughly 80 kilometers off the coast of San Diego, to be recovered. Under the current launch plan of August 29th, Orion would return October 10th. If it launches on September 2nd or September 5th, splashdown will be October 11th or October 17th, respectively. All three of these dates support the long mission profile. Orion won't be going to the moon empty. Inside, it will have three anthropomorphic test devices. The first is Commander Munikin Campos, which is named after Arturo Campos, who was a key person in helping to bring the Apollo 13 crew safely back to Earth. Campos is a male-based mannequin that will wear an Orion Crew Survival System suit, which Artemis astronauts are going to wear during launch, re-entry, and other dynamic phases of missions. It will be equipped with two radiation sensors as well as other sensors to record acceleration and vibration data throughout Artemis 1. The other two test devices are female-based human torsos called Zohar and Helga. They are being used to collect data on radiation levels throughout the mission. 
Zohar will have a radiation protection vest called Astro Rad, while Helga will not, in order to evaluate the effectiveness of the vest, which could allow a crew to continue working during a solar storm. Several other radiation sensors, dosimeters, and biology investigations will also be aboard. Finally, Artemis 1 will carry a technology demonstration called Callisto. According to NASA, Lockheed Martin partnered with Amazon and Cisco to bring an Alexa digital assistant and WebEx video app aboard Orion. The goal is to evaluate how human-machine interface technology can make astronauts and flight controllers jobs easier and safer. Finally, also aboard in the digital form are the boarding passes of more than 3 million people. Let me know in the comments below if your name is going to the moon. When all is said and done, Artemis 1 has four major groups of mission objectives. The primary objective is to demonstrate Orion's heat shield can withstand the conditions of re-entry from lunar return velocities. A second group of objectives involve demonstrating operations in all flight modes. This includes with the rocket and spacecraft, but also with the people and facilities on the ground. The mission is also meant to show that Orion can tolerate the deep space environment. A third set of objectives include actually recovering the Orion crew module after splashdown. This will allow for more data points to be gathered, especially on the experiments inside the capsule, but also allow for the reuse of various high-precision avionics during the Artemis II mission. Finally, a fourth group includes demonstrating an optical navigation system with Orion, as well as the deployment of the ride-along CubeSats. If everything goes as planned, Artemis I will show NASA is ready to send people to the moon for the first time in the 21st century. Artemis II is currently slated for mid-2024, and we'll see three NASA astronauts and one Canadian astronaut fly to the moon using a free return trajectory. Then in 2025 or 2026, NASA hopes to fly four more astronauts to the moon to meet up with a commercial lunar lander, likely SpaceX's lunar starship, to land at least two people on the lunar south pole for a six-day surface day. If you want to learn more about how NASA intends to land the first humans on the moon since 1972, you can check out this video right here. If you're enjoying this content, consider letting me know with a super thanks purchase. I'm trying to do this full time and any support makes it easier for me to spend more time making more videos. But no worries if you can't do that. The most important thing for you to do is like and share this video and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks again for watching and until next time, Ad Astra.